All right, we're live, guys. Let's make sure we're going on Facebook here. Yep, there it is. Perfect. So uh, welcome to uh, another year of uh, recruiting, everyone. It's 2019. A new recruiting season is upon us. And uh, uh, my name is Chris Russell with RecTech Media, uh, here with our first edition of RecTech Live every Thursday coming at you. Uh, with uh, new news and tools and uh, views that you can use to uh, become better recruiters. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, today's show with Jeremy Roberts here. He's uh, coming to us live there from uh, Texas, and we'll chat with him shortly about the uh, future of modern recruiting. Uh, first, a few show notes to get started. Let me turn the uh, music down here. Um, we got a busy January coming up. So we have webinars, as I said, every Thursday at 1 p.m., the next one will be uh, next week, of course, with Olio, and it's called Crazy Good Interviewing. Uh, and we're going to talk about different ways to make your, your interview teams better at that that, uh, that actual tactic and technique. Um, better interviewing, I think, creates a better candidate experience for that candidate, your, your prospects coming in the door. And so you want to tune in for that if you want to get better at interviewing, because that's definitely part of the overall candidate experience and something you should be uh, you know, improving overall. Uh, as you go forward in the uh, new hiring year here. So that's coming up uh, next week. Again, Right Tech Live. You can, uh, I'll share my screen here and you can see what's coming up. I'll give you a quick preview of running here. Um, oh. We'll be going over um, conversational recruitment with Talk Push as well. It's a kind of a recruiting marketing platform that has a mobile app where you talk to candidates. And also talking with uh, the guy, the founder of 70 Million Jobs, which is a uh, it's a job board for the uh, people with uh, felony uh, records, um, people who have been in jail before. Uh, and he's basically trying to push that market as a new channel for employers to hire more people, essentially. Um, and that's going to be an interesting conversation, I think, around uh, why you should be hiring people with uh, with criminal records, you know, giving them a second chance at life and at a career. And that'll be an important discussion, I think, as well, in terms of diversity uh, going forward. So those are the shows coming up uh, next month. And uh, again, rectechlive.com or just follow us on crowdcast.io. Uh, uh, next thing I want to mention is uh, Job Stories. This is our newest product here at RecTech. And if you're looking for a different way to showcase your jobs, to uh, boost your employer brand in a different way, consider doing a Job Stories. These are basically live webinars, just like we're doing here with your employees talking about life at your company, uh, what it's like to work there, uh, what types of jobs you have open, what the career paths are like. You can see an example one here with a uh, Operave software we did. Uh, they're from California. And um, it's a 30 to 60 minute long webinar, just kind of getting to know you as an employer and then pushing that out there across social media on Facebook Live, YouTube Live. And at the end of it all, you get a list of all the candidates that came, which you can then remarket your jobs to. And you also get a, a copy of the video itself. So it becomes a reusable piece of uh, content for you, for your for your recruiting marketing um, and your employer brand. You can embed it on your website if you want to. Uh, it's a really great tool. It's cheap. It's less than a thousand bucks. Uh, and if for a live event, that then becomes a reusable piece of content. I think it's a pretty great ROI because you're getting with a list of candidates and you're getting um, an actual file out of it as well that you can take home and, and use uh, as you wish. So that's jobstories.com. Just sign up for a demo and uh, we'll get that uh, scheduled for you overall. Also want to mention uh, Profit2. This is um, uh, a new uh, free sourcing tool that is put up by Hiring Solve, one of our, uh, our guests today. Um, and they have a beta invite only. It's uh, turbo.profit.rocks. And if you sign up, you can get access to this uh, pretty cool uh, sourcing tool. Uh, they're making all the data free, essentially. Um, they want to uh, put it out there. It's uh, I've been using it as a, uh, the beta tester, and so far, so good. So uh, go sign up because I think it's a pretty great way to uh, to boost your sourcing efforts for free, and something that uh, you know is, should be a you know in your toolbox if you're if it's not already. So again, uh, turbo.profit.rocks, and uh, Jeremy, we'll chat about that later as well, I hope. All right, so let me stop sharing and we'll bring Jeremy on to get the uh, show started. 
So Jeremy Roberts is from Hiring Solves, as I mentioned. And uh, Jeremy, why don't you just introduce yourself, uh, tell us who you are, uh, what Hiring Solve does, and tell us also what we're going to learn today as well. Yeah, great to uh, great to be here with you guys. I my name's Jeremy Roberts. I, um, I I've been in the recruiting space, I guess, since probably two thousand two ish is when I started. And um, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of different environments. I started in third party agency um, in the healthcare space. Did a couple of years there, and then I transitioned to third party finance and accounting search. Um, and then I was with uh, Future Steps. Um, future step corn ferry for about four years. And then I transitioned to corporate recruiting and, and really dove into the sourcing space. Um, at that point, I started a, a sourcing function with Raytheon. Then I managed a um, team of about 25 sourcers um, via Ronstad SourceRight, primarily focused on the Honeywell account. So um, I did that for a couple of years. And then my, uh, my last position before joining Hiring Solved. I was the editor of SourceCon for three years. So um, I organized, I think it was seven SourceCon events over those years and and um, was the editor of the blog. So it was an amazing time uh, for me where I was really able to kind of, um, you know, as a practitioner, you're really focused on your desk and solving one particular set of problems. And then as a SourceCon editor, it was a really a time of growth for me. I was able to, you know, talk to thousands of practitioners and hundreds of technology companies and, and kind of bring them all together in, into a forum and and um, listen and, and learn from all of them. So it was it was really powerful. At at the end of my time at SourceCon, I was I was ready to to make a change. I'm not really a, I, I was an editor, but I, I didn't want to right off into the sunset, just writing blog posts and organizing events. So um, after, after a few years, it was time to move on. And I, I reached out to uh, Sean at Hiring Solved. And um, they were really my, my favorite product that I had come across during my time there. And so I reached out to Sean and, and he made room for me. So forever grateful for that. So nice. So you approached them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I called him and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to, uh, to make a change and not, not sure what that looks like yet. And he said, you know, don't, don't talk to anybody else. Let's, let's work through this. So we, we talked for a few months and, and came up with a uh, position that, that made sense for, for both of us. And it's, it's, it's been a constant evolution, right? When I, yeah. when I started, I was the only kind of talent acquisition practitioner who sat between engineering and sales and kind of put the pieces together. And, um, you know, now we've got a, a full blown kind of customer success, customer experience department, um, you know, that works with all of the, our internal departments and our users. So it's, it's, it's been a great, great learning experience. A lot of fun. Yeah. I think every, every HR tech vendor, no matter what their, uh, you know, specialty is should bring on, you know, industry talent like that. I think it's important because, you know, best in terms of what the, uh, the problems are. To, to be solving right with this with this software because sometimes you see these uh, vendors come out and they're they, they're solving a problem that doesn't exist yet well yeah they're solving a problem that doesn't exist or what you see too often is they like we have a great out of the box solution right but for full user adoption it need we need to understand what's going on inside each client company and and do some customization and then also you know where do we fit into the workflow right so there's a consulting piece of the puzzle that that needs to be solved for in terms of you know this is your current workflow these are all the systems you use this is how we could layer into that so that we really are saving time not just increasing you know the number of places people are having to log in and track things right so um so there's a whole kind of consulting side of it that needs to be accounted for and i i think one of the biggest problems in all software companies is you know they sell the product and then it's on the user to figure out how to use it how to get the adoption and um how to make sure it wasn't a waste of of time and money so yeah. so yeah that's kind of where we fit it's fun right so uh uh you had the uh, higher higher conf conference back in uh november i think it was in new york city and you gave a great talk there on you know uh, about it was about ai and machine learning but to me it really spoke to what the future of recruiting is and so that's why i wanted to have you on to uh start the year because you know recruiting is becoming such a technical technology uh uh, you know, 
crazed profession here and uh, it's becoming much more critical to your to do your job well. And so I really wanted to have you on and talk about that because I thought you, what you what you spoke about that day really kind of encapsulated what the future of recruiting is going to be. So I'm looking forward to uh, going over that again with you. Um, Excellent. So why don't you uh, fire up your uh, presentation there and we'll uh, let's yeah. get started. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this kind of kind of casually. Hold on. I uh, just shared the wrong screen and we are going into a black hole. Hold on. <laughs> um, I'm going to do this kind of casually. You know, we'll, we'll use my slides from the um, from the conference, but I, I definitely want to, you know, have make it make it a little bit more conversational and yeah. um, and kind of talk through that. Um, talk through what we're what we're thinking about here. Yeah. All right. Feel, so, feel free to uh, chime in on the chat too. If you got a quick question as we talk, just throw it out there and I'll interject uh, as we go along with Jeremy. We'll make it, we'll try and make it as much of a conversation as possible. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. absolutely. So, so the name of the talk was how to survive the machine learning and art artificial intelligence disruption. And really um, I, I think this is kind of the, um, this is the, the big question for everybody, right? I think everybody knows that machine learning and AI is going to have an effect on every industry. Um, it, it's not a question. I, I don't, I, I think first of all, philosophically, I don't think that recruiters are going anywhere. I, I think that the job will, will change, you know, and, and kind of what, what we're expected to do will change. And, and, um, so we need to adapt to that. Um, I don't necessarily think robots are going to really um, take over anything, right? So we we talked a little bit about my background, but um, you know, I think I always joke about this slide. I, I kind of started in a boiler room type boiler room, yeah. environment, right? Where it was, um, you know, a bunch of new people. They didn't even give me a desk. You know, I had to stand at a table. You and did? Um, I did. I stood at a table and I made calls. And um, after two of the candidates that I found cold calling placed, they called it getting your chair. And I got my chair right after a, a couple of weeks in. Um, and then, you know, from there, after about six months, I actually got a computer before. I mean, I was using a hospital blue book and just cold calling through hospitals, <laughs> trying to find candidates for different jobs. Talk and so... Sentence. So yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was really, um, it was a cool environment now um, that I think back on it because I was really learning the fundamentals of recruiting that had nothing to do with technology. It was all about the human side of the equation. And so that was what was really powerful. Now, if any of you guys have ever worked inside, you know, an agency environment that was really competitive, you know that your, your competition, I didn't view my competition as being on the outside. My competition was on the inside. It, my, my competition was trying to, my, my challenge was finding people that nobody else in the firm was finding, right? And so I realized really quickly that there were some things that I could do. This is George Boole. Um, there were some things that I could do that would allow me to, um, to find people that other people in our firm weren't finding, right? And so that's kind of when I, I started to get pretty good with the internet and finding new information about people, right? And so that's kind of where that was born. Um, all right, so this slide represents kind of the, the buzz around machine learning and AI that is going on right now. And this is what I oh, think yeah. it sounds like to a practitioner, right? So today we're just gonna kind of cut through all the buzzwords, um, and, and just start talking about what it really means to the actual practitioners, right? Um, basically, we're, we're seeing all kinds of um, headlines out there. You know, robots are gonna take jobs in the next 30 years, the experts are warning. Um, ro robots will erode the middle class. Um, the end of sourcing is near the remaining recruiting challenges is selling. You'll see that articles from 2013, right? Oh, wow. So, so these things have been, um, these things have been, you know, buzzing for a while. Right. Um, and then there's technology will replace doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. Right. So all kinds of crazy um, predictions out there. You know, I, I don't necessarily think, 
that it's going to replace any of those professions. But I do think they'll all change, right? Um, like this here, it says IBM's Watson saved a woman from leukemia, right? Discovered a, a disease that, that doctors had missed. I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing, right? Just by looking at data and exams that this person had had and, you know, um, blood level, all these different things, right? They're able to come up with that. Um, all right, so, so my prediction, right? I, you know, how much time do we actually get to spend with doctors? It's like two minutes, three minutes max, right? So mm -hmm. my hope is that once they have better tools and there's better diagnostic work going on, then I don't think the physicians will disappear. I think they're actually going to be able to do more of what they got into the business for, and that's caring for patients. You know, most of them, I think, got into it because they care about people and they want to make a difference in their lives. So I think, you know, the diagnostic side of healthcare, right? Once that has become more automated and, and the, the machine learning and AI is able to help uncover things quicker and, and solve things like this right here. Um, my hope is that, you know, the, the doctors are gonna focus on the human side of the equation and, and be able to provide better patient care and spend more time with us, right? Um, bottom line, you know, I don't, I don't think this is the, the future you know, brace yourselves, we're yeah. coming, right? I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's doom and gloom. Um, there was I, a story, Jeremy, hold on, there was a story in the news uh, a couple months ago where some, Am some Amazon robots at the warehouse, uh, I don't know, they spilled some bear spray and they hurt some, uh, some of the, uh, the workers there. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I forget. I, 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 I saw the headline, there will be accidents. I, I didn't read that. Right. Yeah. There, yeah. there can be all kinds of accidents. Right. Um, and I think Amazon's a great example, right? There, there's a lot of things changing because of Amazon, like the Amazon stores and everything, but then think of the number of tech jobs that have been created because of that. Right. So it's really about transitioning our skill set, not necessarily, um, you know, doing away with us, right? So I, I, I think as as recruiting professionals, as long as we kind of know what the the future holds, it it'll help us kind of kind of plan for that. Um, you know, so what does that leave us with? If you guys have seen Office Space, you know, these guys they show up and they're like, so what what do you do? You know, and they're kind of evaluating all of us to see where we fit the the new model, right? And so. Um, so no, I think, I think it's good for all of us to kind of explore where technology is affecting recruiting so that we can then, um, you know, go in and, and start to, uh, to affect, you know, make sure that we're, we're applying the right skills and, and learning the right things as we, as we move into that space. Um, one thing, if you're interested in this at all, everybody should go read the 100 year study on artificial intelligence. Um, it is a, exactly what it sounds like, you know, they're looking at artificial intelligence and how it's, how it's affecting the world. And basically the big thing that they're saying is AI will likely replace tasks rather than jobs in the near term. And it will also create new kinds of jobs, right? So I don't, I don't, I don't think it's doom and gloom, you know, the robots, the robots are coming, but they're not, they're not taking over anything, right? Um, when we think about like the task oriented things that we used to have to do in recruiting, I mean, I remember resume parsing, right? Remember how that's something we all expect. If I upload yeah. a resume, we, we now expect it to be parsed into the right fields in any system we're using. I remember, you know, when I would add a candidate to an old applicant tracking system back in the day, I mean, you would t copy and paste every field you know, copy and paste the name, copy and paste the email address, right? There was no, there was no parsing, right? That was a part of my day. Um, you know, another place that, that AI and ML has already changed recruiting is all the, all the aggregators out there. You know, the, the fact that it's crawling the internet and then machine learning is evaluating candidates and saying, okay, this is the same Chris Russell from Twitter. And then here he is on Facebook about me and, and LinkedIn and, and, and they kind of mash it all together. Right. That's something we used to do manually. Um, you know, candidate matching, candidate ranking, um, duplicates and database. I mean, these are all things that we take for granted now that, you know, 10 years ago we were we were all doing manually. You know, the profile aggregation when I was at Corn Ferry, I would 
I would find somebody on one social network, then I'd go look on another, and then I'd go look on another, and I'd, I'd combine all that data, and I'd try to find an email address. And if I couldn't find one, I would try to predict one based off of what I knew from other people at that organization, right? Now, I mean, that whole process is any number of free Chrome tool extensions, you know, is yeah. doing that for you. So, um, so I mean, this is, this is how it's already changed recruiting. And, you know, unless your beard is gray like mine and Chris's, you may not you realize how fast that happened, right? New people to the industry may not realize all the things we were doing, you know, um, back in, you know, even 2008 and nine, you know, it's really rapidly already affected us. Um, you know, as we, as we kind of move forward, you know, I, I think it's important. And by the way, I know how to spell organization. An Australian friend of mine, Martin Warren, created this slide um, <laughs> for a blog post uh, long ago. And, um, you know, as, as we move forward and, and all this kind of automation is starting to affect our desk, um, I think it's important to analyze your requisition load. Right. So there are recs that are low scarcity and low criticality. Those are the ones where like, you know, if I if I find this person, I'll hire them, but it's not really critical. Right. And you've got high scarcity, high criticality up here in the second quadrant. And those are the ones that, you know, if um you know, this this is not a real critical role, but if I find them, it's they're very rare, so I would probably want to hire them. High scarcity and high criticality, you know, that's the engineer that there are only 10 people like this in the United States, and you need them because you have an SLA that says this person will be hired by this date, right? Or you can't bill your client, whatever it is. The high, high scarcity, high criticality, and then there's low scarcity, high criticality. Like, maybe think of like the Amazon worker, in a, a warehouse at, at the holiday season, right? Those are not scarce profiles to find people capable of that job, but it's highly critical that you have them at the right time. You know, for example, the holidays or people won't get their gifts, right? Yeah. So, um, so I think it's important to use this, this quadrant, these quadrants to really understand what, um, what it is that, that you're working on and, and where I think automation is able to affect things right now is in the bottom quadrant, you know, low scarcity, low criticality, that tends to be more transactional, right? Um, that, that tends to be things that, you know, if you're interested, apply here, great. You meet the criteria. Um, here's a text message with your onboarding paperwork, whatever it may be, right? These are places where, there's not a lot of selling going on. This person wants the job. They're qualified and you can, you can take care of it in an automated way. Um, and then you see that the red circle, it, it overlaps into the other three quadrants, but it, it, there's no way that automation is ever going to do everything that needs to be done for the highly scarce, highly critical candidates. Right. Yeah. Um, and so for, this is my first bit of advice, right? Um, for the recruiters out there, um, if you find yourself working in really transactional spaces, you know, and the steps that you do every day can be automated, you're going to be the first to go, <laughs> right? Um, so you need to be developing all the skills that would allow you to operate in these other three quadrants, right? So yeah. go ahead, Chris, what were you going to say? Uh, look, looking back in your career, Jeremy, what's an example of that um, from your past? Maybe do you have a like a favorite sourcing story that you you you, know, you were proud of? You went out and found this person, and uh, you used your you know, used your your soft skills to uh, basically uh, convince them to take the job. Yeah, no, and I'm going to get into kind of what I think those soft skills are here in a little bit. But absolutely, right? If I was working at a government contractor. And, um, you know, there were jobs there in, in plants that were a little bit more transactional, right? Some kind of lower level and, and more highly available skill sets that were really transactional. And so there were people doing those. Um, and kind of where I built my career was on these outer edges. And it was really like one of the jobs I was working at at this government contractor was systems engineers who worked in space situational awareness. So meaning they built satellites that analyzed everything in space and knew of any potential threats to the United States that were happening in space, right? Okay. High, highly specialized. 
None of them were applying for jobs. All of them kind of hid because they were cleared, right? So I would have to call them and say, hey, you know what, Chris? I understand you're content. I understand you like your job, right? You're not actively seeking a job. But tell me, what what would motivate you to consider a change in the future? What would that need to look like? And I, you know what? I won't bother you every week. If you just tell me kind of what those things would be that would motivate you in the future, and then I'll only reach out to you if we could actually do that for you at some point in, in the future. Does that sound fair? And then, you know, these passive candidates would, would start to open up to me, right? Um, and sometimes, obviously, you know, you can you can make those concessions. You can improve their situation right now. But having the ability to open those people up to a conversation, even though they were absolutely positively content and not looking, right, um, and, and really dig deep, that's the only way to fill jobs like that, you know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you, you've got to, to survive, I guess, my, my first my first bit of advice is is you got to figure out how to get outside of this area that can be automated you know because if it if it's a task that can be automated it will be in the very near future and it probably already is in some organizations it's, organizations are slow to adopt you know if you've got 40,000 employees it's hard to totally change your process but you know um, i would if you're if you're in very transactional work right now someone has already figured out how to automate that piece of the job, even if your company hasn't adopted yet. So you, you got to start working on whatever. If you like being a recruiter, you know, um, you've got to figure out how to, how to get outside of that red circle. Yeah. This automation is going to really help. I think uh, the small uh, departments, you know, the, the one or two or three you know, HR teams, um, because they're, they can, they'll, 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 let, they'll be able to leverage this the most in terms of freeing up their time. I think a little mm -hmm. So have yeah, absolutely. I mean, before before they go hire all those administrative types of people to, you know, like if, if you're only if you're only we had a candidate, I mean, a, a client the other day, like they had recently purchased hiring salt. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the features that they were interested in was stack ranking candidates who apply to jobs. Right. They had a team of people that all they did was on their high volume jobs, 400 people apply. They would look at those 400 applies and then highlight the ones that the recruiters needed to review based on how they fit the, the requisition. And um, that, for example, that's black and white, right? That's a computer can do that in no time. And they had, you know, 15 people that that was their only job, hmm. right? And, and so, um, you know, with with one integration, you know, they're able, and that's not recruiting, by the way, they had a recruiter title or a source or title, but they weren't sourcing, they weren't sourcing or recruiting, they were reading resumes, they're just right? Screening. Yeah, they were screening, right? And so that, that to me is, uh, the, you know, anybody doing work like that, I mean, it's, uh, you know, like I said, your organization may be slow to adopt. And so you can ride that out a little bit longer, but, but you've got to get out of those really transactional things. Um, so that, that brings me to, um, you know, these principles. I'll tell you what the Elmore principles are later on. Um, but, or I'll tell you where I came up with the Elmore principles from. But, but I um, know yourself. You need to know who you are and what you're good at. You need to know your strengths and weaknesses. Um, you need to improve upon those weaknesses and then dominate with your strengths and then find an environment in which you can thrive. Okay. So this is this advice right here. I'm not advising HR tech people. I'm not advising, you know, talent acquisition VPs. This is advice for, you know, the person who is a recruiter or a sourcer in the trenches who wants to make sure that, you know, you love your job and you want to keep going that direction. Um, this is advice for those types. Know yourself, know your strengths and weaknesses, improve your weaknesses, dominate with your strengths, and then find a place where you can thrive, right? Um, all right, so as you, as you think about this, like trying to determine what your strengths and weaknesses are, um, I like to, uh, to start to outline it like this. You know, there are two types of talent acquisition professionals. The first one does everything they're told to do right? They, they use the tools they've been provided. You know, my company owns this ATS and they own this CRM and they bought this one job board, right? And they kind of become a master at that. 
Yep. Um, they're order takers. They do, they do, you know, their hiring manager says, I need this. And they say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And they go look for it and they don't ever push back. Right. These are the kind of people that like, if you teach them Boolean, like uh, you'll spend two hours training them on how to write a Boolean search string. And then at the, you know, the, the company that, that owns the website will change their URL structure. And then this person will email you and say that Boolean string broke. Will you send me another one? And it's like, no, I, taught you how to create one, right? Go now create one based on the new structure of the URL, right? These are people that, that kind of, they, they, they need to be told what to do, right? They're not closers. They don't embrace the fundamentals of recruiting that we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. Um, and they're a victim of tools and processes, right? They're, they're, they're taught how to use tools, not how to recruit. And then that's, they think that's recruiting, right? Um, the other type, they quickly master recruiting tools and then they find new free tools. So like this, in this example, you know, they're given an ATS, they're given a CRM and a job board. They master those really quickly. And then they start finding all these other free tools and free resources. And they're exploring technology that wasn't built for recruiting, right? There, maybe it's a marketing platform that, that gives you a lot of data. Maybe it's a, you know, what, whatever, some sort of like web scraping tool that allows you to, to bring a lot of information to your, to your fingertips. So um, they view every data source as an opportunity, right? Um, the first type of candidate is like, or the first type of recruiter is like, no, no, there, that doesn't have exactly what I need. So it's not a good source. Right. This, this, this type of profile, they see everything as a starting point, as a new opportunity. Every data source is something to recruit from. Um, they're constantly learning and then they're educating their peers, right? They're, they're teaching their, their colleagues how to do what they're doing and the new things that they've learned. Um, and then they're selling during every call, right? They're not the first type of person. They, they get a job description from a hiring manager and then they call and they try to, um, do you have job experience? Do you have Python experience? Oh, okay. And then they end the call, right? This type of person, the, the second type of recruiter, they're out there, they're constantly selling in every call, right? They're moving the ball forward, even, even when it's just an initial phone screen, right? All right. So the other thing that I look at is there are people who are talkers versus typers, right? If the, some people are, are the kind that they want to be on the phones and they want to be moving the ball forward, right? The other kind are typers. They, they love the online hunt and they love, you know, finding the information and tying it all together. Right. So I think we can all, we can all identify, like I, I'm primarily the talker, but I, I got pretty strong at the typer side, if that makes sense. So if I were, when I worked with Glenn Cathy um, and we were talking about new hires, he would be like, I have this person 70% typer, 30% talker or the <laughs> vice versa, right? That's the, and we, that was a common language for us. And we knew how to, we knew what that meant. And we knew what we were going to vet, right? So um, sometimes you needed a typer, sometimes you needed a talker, right? So it was a great way for us to, uh, to evaluate. What were we going to say? Did, how long did you work with Glenn? A couple of years. I don't remember exactly. He was the head of, uh, he was the head of global sourcing at Ronstadt SourceRite when I was the sourcing manager for Honeywell. Gotcha. So, um, so he, he, he trained a lot of the resources that were on my team. And then he was um, kind of the central hub, um, you know, as we deployed solutions to the, specific clients, right? So I led the client team and he was the, the central hub. So it was pretty awesome. All right. Now, um, the traits of a talker, you know, they get their energy talking to people. Uh, they enjoy influencing people, hiring managers, candidates alike. Um, they're oftentimes partnered with a sourcer. The, the risk of being a talker, I mean, is these people may, may become completely dependent upon sourcers and have no idea how to function inside a technology solution, right? Mm -hmm. They become, they're, they're really basic sometimes if they're not careful. So they, they need to make sure not to lose those skills. Um, and then there's the, uh, the typer. The, these are the ones who kind of lose their energy after stepping into a room full of people, right? When I walk into a conference, my adrenaline starts pumping. Um, when my wife does, she, she gets exhausted at the end of the day. You know, it just, it totally wears her out. Mm -hmm. um, 
They enjoy finding information online. They, a lot of these prefer not to talk to candidates, right? They like to shoot an email and, and see if they're interested or even just build the list and let somebody else do that. Um, the risk for these people, they may fall victim to what Glenn refers to as the obsessive exotic sourcing syndrome. You mm -hmm. know, um, the way I define that, if, if there are 10 people who can do a job, if I can find eight of them, I can get a few of those on the phone and have success. Mm -hmm. This person who falls victim to a obsessive exotic sourcing syndrome, if there are 10 people who can do it, they'll find eight and then they'll spend three, three days tracking down the other two, you know, <laughs> um, instead of just getting on the phone and, and making something of the eight they already found. Right. So, so they can, they can chase, chase things too far. Right. Yep. Um, now, so there are people who identify with both of these, right? You've got your talkers and your typers, um, you know, and they're both incredibly valid, right, to, to what we do. Um, the thing I think everybody needs to be aware of, in 2008, it was really difficult to build a list of people, right? It was really tough to source candidates. Um, and so this is how things looked in a lot of organizations. Every recruiter was partnered with a sourcer you may have called them something different. It may have been candidate engagement specialist and, you know, um, account manager, whatever it is. Right. But there was a typically a one talker partnered with a typer in, in an organization at that point, people had huge research departments cause it was difficult to build a list. Um, and then whoever, whoever had the biggest list always won. Right. Um, starting in about 2017, this is what we started to see. Right with all the aggregators and um, the search interface of the tools we use got more and more simple to use, right? Um, we didn't need as many typers to, um, you know, to, to create a list, right? Now the problem is not having a big list of people, it's having a list of people who actually wanna to talk to you. Yeah. So, so those people who were just typing, people started saying, okay, stop sending me big lists. This is actually something we had a, we had a research firm. They were sending us lists all the time. And it's like, I don't want a list of 300 more people. I want you to send me three who want to hear from me. Yeah. Right. So those people who were just typing, they started having to call and, and get them excited and interested for me before I would even take them, take the name from them. Right. So yeah, golden age of sourcing now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Like if you getting correct, like if you look at this, the, the evolution of sourcing data, getting correct information was the challenge in 2002. You know, it was a manual process. Um, and like SourceCon was the big sourcing conference that launched in 2008. It focused on online research and, and that's all they covered. Uh, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, we all have access to the same data, right? absolutely positively have access to the same data. It's about finding the right people at the right time now, right? And so that the job of the typer is not gone, but it is my belief that to be this person, right? Used to, if you were good at searching and building lists, you could be one of these. Now, the one person who is here, if you look, the one typer who's supporting the team now, they're much more sophisticated than they used to be, right? Yeah. So the, these people typically know, they know enough JavaScript to build a bookmarklet, right? Glenn Guttmacher used to teach a lot about how to build bookmarklets and, and little things like that, right? They know enough coding to, to, to dissect an API and make use of it, right? They know how to connect one system to another, you know, they know how to scrape data and load it into a new system, right? So these people have gone from being good at search to knowing they might not be a full blown developer, but they can take things apart and piece them together and 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 build solutions yep. from things that already exist, right? And so so people are all you know people. There were a lot of people, for example, who loved sourcing because they were introverts, but they weren't technical enough to turn the corner and, and be this person in 2018, 2019. Does that make sense? Yep. Totally. So, so now, you know, I think of people like, you know, 
Aaron Lintz and, you know, Glenn Guttmacher and, and those types of, of people who are highly technical. And, you know, they're the one person in that department kind of tying all those systems together, right? That's how, you know, that's how you have to be now. If, if you want to be the, the technical guru of your department, it's way more sophisticated than it was in 2008 or nine. People thought I was technical back then. I wouldn't put myself in the same category now as, as the, the people who can survive there. There's a, there, I met a few like uh, coders too have kind of more moved into recruiting. Have you uh, met a lot of those over the last couple of years? Absolutely, right. Uh, they they've they've learned how to. Well, I mean, and that's how our company started. Is our founder Sean Burton? You know, he was a developer. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a technology expert, and then he started. He built kind of a is a recruiting firm, but like more like staff augmentation. You know, like they were providing technical resources to Google and a bunch of other tech companies. And um, that's exactly where our firm started. And and then he started to see ways that his development side could speed up the process, you know? So yeah, there are a lot of people in in the great news for those people, they understand the people who are in the highest demand. Right. So if they've got a personality and can engage them, they, they really do a good job. All right. Now, regardless of whether you're a typer or a talker, these are the things I think you need. You still need to know Boolean. Um, why? You, you should, why do they still need to know Boolean? Because yes. it's, they don't need to know Boolean to use tools necessarily. Like the tools did not require you to know Boolean, but studying Boolean is like studying algebra. It teaches you how to think about a problem and how to separate things. Like, so if I, I am looking for this skill or this skill or this skill and this skill, right? It it teaches you how to think logically. Um, And all of the search interfaces that don't require Boolean anymore, um, they still require people who know how to think logically. (laughs) You know, so this is just kind of elementary school to me, right? The, The systems you use may not require it, but... I train thousands of people every year to use technology and it's always easier to train someone who understands logic and, and the way data sets are, are constructed. And that's what Boolean gives you. Gotcha. It, it just, it, it's a strange thing because you probably wouldn't use it, you know, as much moving forward, but, but if you understand it, you, you can just really take apart problems easier. Yeah, it's a so, good foundation to have. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes it, it makes people um, – it gives you kind of a common language to speak to as well. Um, you should become the, an expert at understanding human capital data information retrieval and analysis, right? That's a big word, right? Um, that's something I learned from Glenn. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's a, a Glenn Cathy um, topic. But – you know, you need to human capital data and information retrieval. I talked to a friend of mine who's a recruiter at a large tech company today. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, they gave me a a market mapping project where they want to know how many people we have access to in each of these markets. And, um, you know, so he's spending a week putting together that report, right? So you need to, that, that, that to me is one of the skill sets that separates a recruiter with $140,000 salary from a recruiter with an $80,000 salary. You know, it's a, uh, it's a big, um, you know, this number two is a big deal. Um, so you get, you need to go, you know how to get data from all these different systems and, and know how to display it in a way that tells a story. Um, and you need to be able to, master your tools that your company has and then how to fill in the gaps, right? Cause the, the people who are most valuable, right? There there's plenty of people who understand all the tools your system has. There are not a lot of people who know how to bring things from the outside to, uh, to fill in the holes. Okay. Let's stop for a second, Jim. We got a couple questions from the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll start with Mary Ann's first. She says, I still love Boomly and the next ray, but can anyone share what, if any job boards people are using? Uh, I guess with Boolean, are they even used besides Indeed? Just wanted to get your thoughts. So, um, can what a, do you know any other job boards you can use Boolean on? I guess is the I question. Think, most Indeed. of them, 
most of them have a, like an expert search mode where you can, you know, um, well, to be honest, I, that was a good... public almost. You can, yeah, you can still use Google to search and resumes. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, it's crawlable. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would assume you could still x-ray Google. That's a good one for the, you know, other practitioners who might be watching to answer in the call in the, in the chat box there. Um, you know, where are other people using Boolean at this point? I, I think most, most of the systems I know of have an expert search mode or they're, they're Boolean friendly. For example, in like the company field of any of the tools I've seen, you could do an or statement, you know, um, I want to see people from this or this or this, you know? So, um, most of the time in the title and company field and in, in most tools they're, they're they support Boolean. I've seen actually some that they still don't, right? They never even got there. Some tools are moving beyond Boolean and some some still haven't gotten there. And some of the CRMs that I've looked at lately um, don't even support Boolean search, you know, in, in their field searching. So um, some have moved beyond, some have not even arrived. It's a, but yeah, I would, I would be interested after after our call today to see what people put in the column there um, you know, what their experience is with different tools. Good question. Yeah. Most job boards are, you know, have their resume access, uh, privatized, so you can't access to it. So yeah. There are, some, there are some smaller niche ones out there that may have public resumes, but they are uh, few and far between. So. Yeah. I would say the, the big things that I see people x-ray, if we're talking Boolean to x-ray, then that would be GitHub, Stack Overflow, Angel, dot co you know they're they're gonna be yeah angelist they're gonna be things like that um not necessarily resume databases but um more social network or code repositories yeah profile what's your dog's name there oh that's jasmine you guys can still see me even though i'm sharing my screen this is jasmine yeah, yeah just you're, you're yeah, small yeah. you're Jasmine works, Jasmine works with me and, and I haven't paid attention to her for the last 30 minutes. So she's getting a little anxious. So it's a poodle, right? That is a standard poodle. And, and then we've got two miniature poodles over there oh, wow. in the chair, um, in the chair behind her. So they're, <laughs> they're just chilling. So, so yeah, I, I constantly have three with me. So <laughs> nice. good stuff. Are nice. there other questions or should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. All right. So what the tech like, expert uh, needs to know. If you want to be that last technical guy or a girl standing in your department, right? You need to know basic coding skills. You need to know how to automate tasks with bookmark marklets, gather data by scraping or crawling, acquire data with APIs. You need to know how enterprise software integrates at scale, right? Um, you need to know how tools can supplement or uh, impact the ROI and you need to be able to tell a story with all that data and, and, um, you know, use it to make better, better decisions. Right. Um, a notice for the, the tech expert, right. You still need to know how to influence people, sell ideas, understand business problems and candidate experience. Right. So you, you never really get away from the soft skills. Um, but you know, to be the, you know, and, and this, this deck there, you know, like I said, there are a lot of people who called themselves sorcerers in 2008 who are really good at searching, but they've never, they've never done what this slide says, basic coding skills, how software integrates, how tools can supplement and impact ROI and how to tell a story with that data, right? So if you want to be the, the tech expert in the department, you know, in 2020, this is kind of minimum right here, what, what you see on this slide. You have any favorite uh, tools, Jeremy, as far as learning any of this stuff? Like, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, know Linda.com or something like that you want to throw out there? You know, like Code Academy, I haven't looked at it lately, but Code Academy is pretty awesome, right? If you want to go and, and start basic JavaScript and, and things like that. But, um, you know, and then how, how software integrates. I mean, I would start with one, start to learn about APIs and, and learn basic coding and, and scraping, but then how software integrates. I mean, that's more people letting you, you know, getting involved in project teams at your company or letting you, letting you try to solve problems there. You know, that's more of a hands-on thing. Yeah. Um, and then the storytelling, I mean, that's a, 
that to me is really a, um, I've, I've used mentors for that. You know, um, you need to identify people who are really good at that. Yeah. You need to identify people who are good at that, who can help you do that. You know, um, somebody in your organization is really, really talented at that. And, and, um, you know, I still learn, we, we do this for our clients, right. And, and we actually just hired someone who's incredibly gifted at this, you know, more so than me, um, at dissecting a process and understanding the KPIs to illustrate ROI, you know? So, um, there's somebody in your organization who's good at that. If not in your organization, you find somebody outside who's good at that and, and, um, and have them help you help mentor you on that. I mean, it's a, it's a really important skill, you know, not only if you work in an HR tech company to validate your existence, but I mean, if you, if you suggest that your company spends $50,000 on a tool, um, you better be prepared in 12 months to show how it worked, you yeah. know, um, or you may find yourself looking for a job or the worst case. I mean, you know, best case scenario, if you can't illustrate it, they just won't renew and you don't have that tool next year. But um, so, you know, to keep the tool and to keep your job, you, you've got to be able, if you recommend a hundred thousand dollars spend, you've got to be able to illustrate what happened when you did that, you know? So, so that's pretty, pretty critical piece of it. Gotcha. All right. So regardless of if you're kind of the talker or the typer, you've got to master the tools, explore tools and not build for TA, test their limits, seek new, ex new solutions, and then exploit all opportunities. Right. Um, what, what's up? I was, I was going to jump into some of the soft skills. We don't have a ton of time left. Chris, was there anything that you want to make sure I, I speak to before we, do uh, that just or over, just go over really briefly real quick and uh, we can kind of end there if you want. Yeah. So, so what do I think the human touch can affect? And these are, you know, you could do, you could do a webinar on each of these, right? Yeah. Um, Chris, I mean, but these are where the human touch can still affect recruiting, right? So as things get more automated um, it, it's, I, I really truly believe that people who were hired into recruiting in the last five years were done a complete disservice because you were not taught. Like when I was, when I was hired and they didn't even give me a desk, you know, they gave me a phone and a hospital blue book. Um, all I was taught was how to engage with candidates, how to screen and assess a candidate, how to interview a candidate, um, how to do a good intake meeting. And I was taught during every one of those steps how to be selling and, and getting information that was going to make sure the candidate didn't walk away in the end. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is what the human touch can affect. And, and most people who were hired in recent years, unless you had an amazing manager, I'm not saying everybody, but unless you had an amazing manager or a training program, most people were taught how to use software to recruit. They were taught how to use, you know, this is our ATS, this is our CRM, and this is the large professional network we use. And this is how you use them all. They were not taught the psychology of recruiting, you know, and how to how to build rapport and 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 get to become the influencer you need to be with your candidates and your hiring managers. So that's the piece that I think is missing right now. And as as the world becomes more automated and our workflows become more automated, these are the people who are going to stand out or the people who have mastered that. And so, like, what does that mean for the intake meeting? Don't take order, orders. Use it as an opportunity to establish credibility. Um, use data from past jobs to tell the hiring manager, okay, well, I understand what you're wanting. This is how long it'll take if you do that. You know, if you remove this criteria or you open it up to this geography, we can do it in this amount of time. So go prepared, right? Um, get the manager to commit to a process. You know, what, what the process looks like doesn't matter. It, it just needs to be consistent and you need to kind of manage that process. Um, and then remember that strange candidate behaviors typically start with a broken process. I think Jim Durbin was the one who said that so succinctly for me um, that I, I grabbed onto that, right? Candidate management. Don't forget candidate control starts with the first phone screen. Um, you know, actually use that time to become their friend, give them advice on their job, you know, on their, on their, help them tell their own story. You know, I had a, um, a recruiter one time looked at my resume and he was like, wow, you've got a lot of job changes here. Tell me about it. And I started telling him and I was kind of like apologetic that I look like such a flake. And he was like, you know what? 
these job changes are pretty powerful because as I probed, you led on to me that you were following a manager who was taking on additional responsibility and he was taking you with him because you were his key problem solver, right? right? And you, you were his fixer. So these three jobs were under one mentor who kept taking you to solve problems. And, you know, he helped me shape my own story in a way that has always helped me. Right. And so I'll always be loyal to that recruiter and I'll always listen to him. Right. Um, uncover hidden objections and hot buttons, right? Too many recruiters these days, they, they call and they're like, Hey, um, do you have this skill, this skill, this skill, and this skill? And once they say yes, they are like, awesome. Well, let's go ahead and set up an interview, but they didn't get, they don't understand that person's hot buttons and what's going to make them accept the job or what's going to make them decline the job in the end. Right. So they, they didn't get personal enough to, um, to save the deal if it starts to fall apart in the end, you know, and why does this person do what they do? Why did they make those changes? Why did they choose that major? You know, asking them, why did you choose to be a Spanish major in college? Well, I, I chose to be a Spanish major in college because I wanted to live in Spain. And once I got there, I didn't want to come home. That was the only degree I could have after I spent a year there. That's my story, by the way. But so, you know, why, have, why did they do the things that they did throughout their career? And that will give you ammunition when you're trying to get them to accept your offer because you're going to understand how they think and what's important to them. So these are the, these are the, the kinds of things. Every step of the process, I don't really have time to go into all of it with three minutes left. But, I mean, assessing, screening, and interviewing, you know, you need to um, really have a process for doing that to uncover the deep, deep, deep motivations of the candidates you're working with. Yeah, that candidate experience is such a hot thing now, and I think it's so important in this economy that if you are treating the candidates well throughout the process, it's just going to help you in the long run. And if you're not, you're just going to turn them off, and you know you don't. Yeah, lose that. all the candidate experience stuff I hear is a lot of it is based on um, it's based on technology solutions for the candidate experience, right? Like to me the biggest part of candidate experience is, is becoming their friend and understanding what's important to them and being compassionate. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so like, if you truly understand what their motivations are and you understand what makes them tick and what's going to be important to them, um, then you're, you're able to provide, you know, a much better candidate experience. And that goes into briefing and debriefing candidates, right? Pause your screen. If you've got it here, um, briefing and debriefing candidates, like, helping them understand what they're about to sit through, helping them understand what the manager's looking for. You don't want to give them information to make them lie to the manager. You don't, when I say prepping candidates for an interview, you're not giving them information that is bad, but you're, you know, if you set two people up on a date, you could be like, okay, you know, her last, her last boyfriend was this way. You don't want to <laughs> accidentally do that. Right. I mean, that, you're not telling them to be someone they're not. You're just giving them, advice that will help them establish a better rapport. You want both, you want to prep the candidates and the clients for the meetings, you know, and give them what they need to be successful in that meeting for the client that, you know, Hey, be sure to probe about this. I was interested in this story, you know, be sure to, for the candidate, be sure to ask about this because you know that, that, that candidate, is going to be really excited about a certain type of project that 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 manager can offer, right? So you want to make sure both parties know what what motivates the other people, so that they can have a really productive and good meeting. Um, all too often, I've I've gone in as a recruiting manager into a department where they just set interviews and let them happen, and then they don't even debrief, and they wonder why their deals fall apart, right? The mm -hmm. the, the recruiters who are going to be standing in twenty twenty when things are more automated are going to be experts in this, and it. If you didn't learn these things, I mean, these are all the truths of recruiting that basically have been around since the beginning of recruiting, right? Like you need to become an expert in all the things that are completely outside of technology. And I think most people hired recently are, are trained to use the tools we have, not trained on the psychological and, and human side of recruiting. So if you don't have that person in house, you need to find that person, you know, online or, or, you know, a, a, you need to find a mentor or, or invest in training program um, 
you know, oftentimes this, if you're a corporate recruiter, oftentimes this kind of knowledge comes from the agency world, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you, you've got to go find this information, you know, because to me, these soft skills are really what's going to make somebody stand out, you know, um, to go back to my, my list, it's, it's, you know, the soft skills where the human touch can really affect things, the intake meeting, candidate management, assessing and screening. So, you know, that first phone screen, the minute, you know, they have the skills, you don't get off the phone. You spend 30 minutes building rapport and getting to know them. And then I, I always hear millennials say like, well, but people in our generation don't like to talk on the phone. Right. Right. But okay. So let's imagine this person who everybody else is doing it the way they want them to do it. They're just texting them and asking them questions. And then if they both agree, then they're like, text them a, an app to schedule their interview, right? How many people do you think actually spent 30 minutes on the phone getting to know them, right? So while it was uncomfortable for them the first five minutes, you're the only person who spent 30 minutes. How many, how many people out there do you think know all that intimate information about them? Not very many, right? So you have immediately taken things a step further with those people than the majority of, of your peers will because you are you're forcing them to get to know you and to open up and mm -hmm. and other people may not be doing that these days right so um, you know very few people have long conversations about things like that so so I encourage everybody to you know to take people out of their comfort zone and it, it's not rude to do something someone's uncomfortable with right that's not that's not a bad thing. So, um, so don't, you know, just cause they're uncomfortable with a, a, a conversation call doesn't mean you shouldn't do it and, and that it's not in their best interest. Right. Well, this has been great, Jeremy. I think I, uh, I think we painted a nice picture, uh, for the audience as far as what's going to be the, uh, the future of modern recruiting. So I appreciate your time today, number one, and, uh, feel free to, uh, tell people where to connect with you. Tell them what about hiring solid, which guys are up to lately. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Um, I, um, I typically hide. I don't, I don't do much online anymore. <laughs> I'm, I, I kind of just do my job and, and talk to people, but um, I'm, I organize, the, yeah, I organize the higher conf conference. So follow higher conf. Um, I tweet there. I've got a Twitter account. It's um, I am Jeremy R. Um, I'll put I'm putting that in the chat box. I'm Jeremy R on Twitter. Um, I had a big um, Twitter account and I closed it because it was annoying. So I only have a few hundred followers and I like them all now, you know, um, it, so it's kind of fun. So if you're a recruiter or sourcer, come follow me there and I'll follow you back. And, and um, it's, um, it's a much better conversation now that there aren't thousands of people there. Um, it got a little cluttered, but um, and then hiring solved. If you follow hiring solved on Twitter, I, um, I, I send a lot of things from there as well, but, and um, next, and October? next tire comp is in October in New York city. So we're, um, we're taking it from one day, uh, to two this year. So that will be, that would be pretty cool. We're hoping to have the agenda, um, at least a lot of the skeleton of the agenda up by February and we're already selling tickets. They're super cheap right now. So go to hireconf.com. Um, and then profit. So we, we kind of feel that data has become pretty commoditized. Uh, we used to sell data at Hiring Solved. Now we're more about helping people manage their data. And then um, Profit is a free Chrome extension we created that has a lot of really cool features. Um, so go to turbo.profit.rocks to sign up for the beta. It's a pretty cool um, tool that will uh, give you guys access to a lot of free candidates. So Good stuff, man. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. You're welcome back anytime. And uh, always glad to uh, share the screen with the uh, same taste and headwear. So I know. Yep. Excellent <laughs> to, to be here with you. And uh, I will talk to you all soon. Thanks for being here. All right, guys. We'll see you next week, guys. Thanks for watching.